And our BBC One John Craven visits the Isles of Scilly in Country File. <laughs> aboard for a trip around the islands. That's what most visitors come here for, to take a boat to the small rocky islands that make up the cities. And for a few days they can escape from all the pressures of modern living to a place of isolated natural splendor by the dominating sounds of the sea and its birds. But it's not quite like that because they haven't escaped from all those pressures. They're very much here as well. More about that after news update. Amidst angry reaction from the farming industry to further European bans on British beef because of BSE, the president of the National Farmers Union, Sir Simon Gourlay, accused France and Germany of protectionism and causing immense damage to Britain's farming industry. France alone accounts for more than half Britain's beef exports. The Agriculture Minister John Gummer said such bans strike at the heart of decision-making in the European community. The NFU said European community plans to buy up British beef weren't enough and asked the government to ban imports of all beef and live cattle from EC countries. French sheep farmers have been demonstrating against what they say is unfair competition from British lamb. The value of the pound means the cost of British lamb undercuts French prices. The farmers want all lamb imports banned. The government has denied an allegation that it tried to delay a European Commission prosecution over pollution on Blackpool Beach until after water privatisation. The claim was made in the Times newspaper on the basis of documents leaked to it by Friends of the Earth. The Department of the Environment commented, court action is a matter for the Commission. Meanwhile, river pollution levels in the countryside are on the increase because of lack of water. Two years of low rainfall have caused underground water reserves in East and much of Southern England to be dangerously low. Water suppliers are asking users to be economical. There are already hosepipe bans in parts of England with others threatened elsewhere. The National Farmers Union say the way to deal with farm pollution is by giving farmers more advice on how to avoid bad practices. Their response comes after a parliamentary committee report said that fines on farmers were too low. MPs also expressed concern that out of 900 pollution cases reported as serious in 1988, less than a sixth resulted in convictions. The Royal Society for Nature Conservation say the renewed Victorian passion for collecting wildflowers is threatening endangered species. In a new report entitled Where Have All the Wildflowers Gone, 50 are listed as being in danger, including snake's head fritillary and the pasc flower. The report also blames agricultural changes, pollution and peat extraction for the loss of many wildflowers. This is certainly not one of the romantic images we have of the Isles of Scilly. Flowers, yes, and holidays and ancient shipwrecks, but not a rubbish dump. This, though, is reality these days in what are sometimes known as the fortunate islands. Fortune, though, seems to have run out here because they just can't cope with all the waste and rubbish that's being created. It's part of a crisis now facing the islands brought about by the pressures of modern living. And plans to resolve these problems have deeply divided the islanders. Described in tourist brochures as a haven from today's fast-moving world, the Isles of Scilly are a group of about 140 small islands, 20-odd miles west of Land's End. But only five of them are inhabited. Most of the 2,000 islanders live on St Mary's, the highest and the biggest island, which is only three miles long. The Scillies are more than picture postcard deep. Since Neolithic times, they've been regarded as a special, even mystical place. Today, that magic is protected by conservation areas, heritage coastlines, and a marine nature reserve, where islands not much bigger than rocks play host to Atlantic grey seals and to puffins. It's a unique package for visitors who come here to be at peace with nature. 
This is one of the best loved walks along the heritage coastline of St. Mary's. But even here, it's impossible to escape the needs of the modern world, because soon this land could be eaten up by an extension to the runway of the island's airport. Helicopter flights from Penzance are the island's aerial lifeline, but it's a lifeline that's never been permanently secured. Fears that the service might be cut back or even cancelled have led to other flights by small passenger aircraft being encouraged. And this is the result, Heathrow in miniature. Fixed-wing flights have increased eightfold in the past five years, and the grass runway just can't cope. Fresh sods of turf are used for runway repairs, but the Civil Aviation Authority has warned that unless the grass strip is replaced with concrete and lengthened, the future is bleak. Now the local council has obtained one and a half million pounds for those improvements. Our consultants have drawn up a plan which has been accepted by the council of um, making the runways a better profile, a flatter profile. At the same time, it will be hard surfaced and widened and lengthened, which will provide a greater degree of safety for the present users of the runway and also at any time, for whatever reason, should there be um, a temporary or permanent discontinuation of helicopters to give us a wider margin uh, of fixed-wing aircraft which could bring visitors into the islands. The present operator from Land's End operate Islander aircraft, which are small planes and they are noisy planes. There is a possibility that uh, were the runway to be lengthened, then they would be able to bring in a larger plane which would cut down the number of flights and also be quieter. Noise, flight schedules, disturbance. They're all arguments we've heard on a larger scale on the mainland about extensions to Gatwick and Stansted. In relative terms, the impact of the air traffic is just as great here. And on the Isles of Scilly, they've got nowhere else to put their airport. There is an enormous extension proposed, which is going to take that runway, if agreed, right out to the cliff edge. It's going to absorb the present coastal footpath, which admittedly may be diverted, but would, be in a, would not be a very nice footpath to use with aircraft landing and taking off, systems of coloured lights and warnings to, to, to uh, help people along the path. The Trust is absolutely opposed to that. Uh, does not believe that it will be of any benefit to the islands whatsoever. Quite the reverse. Because it could bring larger planes to the island with even more visitors. It's bound to bring larger planes, isn't it? I mean, if the facilities exist, something will move in to take advantage of it. Whatever anyone may say no. We cannot believe that it's in the interest of the islands. We would like to see the Everything kept in the same scale as it is now, small and beautiful. With the controversy over the airport, as with so many other things, the islands are a microcosm of mainland Britain. An improved and extended airport will bring more traffic, more problems, but leave things as they are and the lifeline could be threatened. The only dust cart on St Mary's makes its daily round, collecting an ever-increasing volume of refuse. During the eight-month holiday season, Visitors often double the island's population. So how do you dispose of 4,000 people's rubbish in a place that's only three miles long? Just like the rest of Britain, St Mary's is running out of landfill sites. Tipping everything into the sea is quite rightly banned. And the search for a new site to dispose of the island's throwaway harvest is restricted because almost everywhere, except the present dump, is a place of outstanding natural beauty. The local incinerator is sandwiched between two schools and can't cope with any more work. The council's answer is to create a new landfill site here at Bar Point, a beauty spot already scarred by sand extraction. Local resident Ray Warnes wrote to Countryfile. Ray, why, uh, why are you so uh, head up about all this? Well, this area is going to be made into a tip site if the council gets it w its way, and I feel that it's too beautiful to lose. It's a conservation area an area of outstanding natural beauty and it's a uh, lovely place just to come on a walk and get away from things yes we often do walk this area it's an uh, absolutely beautiful spot most of the local people come here and have been coming here for many years and, and now it could be turned into well something worse than this yes that's right i think that uh, there are alternatives to this uh, that should be gone into by the council the council's plans for Bar Point are subject to a public inquiry later this year. 
People like Ray Warnes are concerned about the effects of coastal erosion if this does become a landfill site. Seepage could cause an ecological disaster. The only other alternative is a nearby quarry, which is already an eyesore. Objectors say it's too small. After three or four years, it will be full. So is a solution to send the rubbish to the mainland. Although uh, it is easy to contemplate shipping refuse to the mainland, we have found that when we have talked to people who are expert in these affairs, that it is by no means as simple and as clear-cut uh, as it first appears. There are questions as to whether or not we should ship raw refuse or whether it should be incinerated refu uh, refuse. Uh, there are questions which are involved if we ship it on a normal ferry or on a boat which it also carries foodstuffs, then we would have to be extremely careful the way in which the refuse is, is taken to the mainland. So if shipping is a problem, maybe recycling the rubbish could be the answer. We've got 650 signatures in favour of separation. I feel that shows that a, a large bulk of the resident population are prepared, well prepared to separate. And I feel that they uh, would back a system like that and would actually take the trouble to see it through. People can separate their waste and to make it easier for recycling. But we're up across the problem on Scilly that uh, the quantity involved in any one type of refuse is so very small that it doesn't become economically viable to uh, take on recycling. A solution has to be found, and soon. It's the same problem all over the British Isles, but here, on these tiny islands, it's possible to see more clearly the crisis that we all create. Water is another of the island services finding it hard to meet demand. In last year's drought, St Mary's nearly ran dry. Council officials drew a chart warning people of dwindling supplies. A reservoir just isn't possible. Rainwater sinks through the rock in the middle of the island and is pumped up through boreholes. When there's an emergency such as last year, locals and visitors alike respond by cutting down consumption. But the underlying problem is always there. Unlike the mainland, there's no way the islands can simply turn on a switch and get more supplies to meet extra demand. We have to be very careful that uh, we don't overpump and lower the aquifer level so that we get saline intrusion, salt water creeping in through the granite, uh, which would pollute our water supply and, uh, well, would finish the islands completely. And so far this year, things don't look too good down the boreholes. Already, a host pipe ban has had to be brought in. With water, as with rubbish, one problem is that we often consume more than we actually need. And the demands of modern tourists mean that lots more people are taking baths on the island. Worst of all, the water isn't even pure. The nitrate level is above European limits. We have to do something about reducing the nitrate content in the water. The problem about that is not just the capital cost of installing the equipment, which may be a major cost, but also the, um, the action itself in taking out the nitrates uh, will use a quantity of water. So the water that is available is going to be reduced still more. The problems of water, waste and aviation reflect recent shifts in the economy in the change of use of these lovely islands. They've been part of the Duchy of Cornwall since 1337, their history intertwined with seafaring, with shipbuilding, ship servicing and shipwrecks. Sometimes up to 250 vessels could be anchored here, but the arrival of steam put an end to all that. By the middle of the 19th century, the last ship to be built here left the yards. Times became hard. Many islanders eat to living by processing kelp. But with the coming of the railway to Penzance and a steam ferry from there to St. Mary's, a market built up on the mainland for the island's flowers, a trade which grew quickly, helped by the mild climate. The subtropical gardens on the island of Tresco were becoming world famous, even exchanging plants with Kew Gardens, and slowly the tourists began to arrive. But by the 1940s, the flower trade was the main business, and the present look of the islands was fashioned by its flower growers. Once again, the community had a steady source of income. Because spring comes early in the Sillies, its blooms were on sale in high street shops when the buds were still growing in mainland gardens. Speedy deliveries were made possible because the airport had been established and the flying flowers became one of the trademarks of the Scillies. But the boom was not to last and in recent years the island's economy has had to change direction once again 
to concentrate on tourism. To see how things used to be before tourism and development took hold on St Mary's, all you've got to do is to take a boat for two miles across the sea to St Agnes. All the untenanted land on the islands is leased by the duchy to the Isles of Scilly Environmental Trust, which has the task of preserving the essential nature of the Scillies for all time. My guide on St Agnes is the director of the Trust, Peter Murrish. Well, I suppose you could say that St Agnes is as near to um, how the Isles of Scilly would all have been, or the inhabited islands of Scilly would all have been, in the past. Um, here, there's little or no commercial development. You've got um, the industry is almost entirely growing flowers, one or two fishing boats, and such um, advantage as is taken of the tourism industry here is uh, in the small cafes, which are largely in private houses, and cottages let out to holiday visitors. And is that how the islanders want it to be? Well, St Agnes, I think, yes. I think the people of St Agnes are identically happy, very contented with the way things are here and I believe they would resist uh, very strongly any attempt to change it. The outer islands, as they're known, do have a particular charm and a sense of peace. This is what attracts the visitors. There's no entertainment here, just places to walk and relax and watch the wildlife. The tourist has to fit in with what nature and the small communities have to offer. It's not the other way around. But even on the outer islands, this special relationship has been under threat. On St. Martin's, a few years ago, there was a celebrated row over the building of a luxury hotel, the first on the island. The Environmental Trust strongly opposed the development, but the duchy and the council went over their heads and gave the go-ahead. We've had a new hotel built on St. Martin's, a big investment there. Whether that will, be, will happen anywhere else, I don't know. I don't think so at the moment. It's not in the, the public mood. Our own view is that we should look at every case on its merits, and again, in discussion with all the other involved parties, uh, find out what is the most acceptable and sensible solution. I don't believe, and we don't believe, that Scilly can be sort of bathed in aspic and allowed not to move at all, because otherwise I think we would just uh, degenerate and go backwards. There's got to, I think there has got to be an, an element of development that are careful and controlled, and we will take our place in that. And that's the very core of the argument, not just here, but in Britain as a whole, controlling development in the best interests and to the best advantage of the community. Until recently, what made City special was that it hadn't changed. The outer islands are still much the same, but for St Mary's, it may be too late. The tiny capital, Hugh Town, bustles with people and traffic. There was an outcry a few weeks ago when the first parking tickets were issued. Tourism has become the main industry. And the only time of day when Hughtown becomes its old, quiet self is when the boats are taking visitors to the other islands. These visitors don't just arrive here by air. Every day, the ferry Silonian brings hundreds more from the mainland, all hoping to sample Scilly's fabled peace and quiet. So, is there a danger that, as the congestion grows, the tourist trade will spoil things for everyone? If you go for numbers, you then end up with the sort of visitors, basically, who want entertainment, who want leisure parks and theme parks and so on. And uh, in Cornwall, that is now the order of the day. The last thing we want in Scilly is that. We want, the, uh, we want to preserve here those natural attributes which visitors have come here for generations to see. I mean, many people have been coming here for 30, 40 years for their holidays. And many of them are complaining now bitterly of the changes they have seen uh, taking place in the islands. Tourism has also put pressure on the housing market, and with severe restrictions on new buildings, prices are reaching London levels. The Duchy and the Council are hard-pressed to meet the demand of local people who couldn't possibly pay such prices, a situation echoed in many rural areas in Britain, except that here, there's nowhere else to look. And tourism itself is in danger because the things that people come here to see have been damaged in recent years, most of all by the weather. Snow and frost hit the islands a few years ago, and the storms last winter battered the gardens of Tresco and destroyed many of the trees and hedges which have always protected the fields on St Mary's. So, if all this was bad for tourism, it was even worse for the farmers. The bad weather piled on the problems for an industry which, in all forms, is going through a difficult period. We've had 
three poor flower seasons. And that isn't a, a good thing. It's not a useful thing for the industry at all or for those participating in it. Um, the flowers we grow are good, but the prices haven't been very high. The potato seasons haven't been very good, and indeed the potato industry is declining here. The flower industry, which is based on the early daffodils, is being badly hit by foreign competition, which cuts prices by operating on a much bigger scale. People are looking over their shoulder very carefully at the because the amount of flowers that come into a cotton garden from abroad and from other places is now enormously more than they used to be. So Silly's got to look this laurels and aim for quality more than, more than ever before. And what about the bulbs? Bulb sales, which only a few years ago used to be a very dominant force and produce a lot of money into the farming, uh, into, into the farmer's pockets, and rightly so, now almost gone, flat and dead, causes considerable pressure now to farmers trying to make good livings off the land. Gordon Bird faces the prospect of getting rid of his dairy herd, even though the islands have to import milk. I could see this was the type of life I, I was going to like and enjoy and would like to bring a family up in this situation. But um, it's all gone sour. Um, I saw the rise of the dairy industry to its heyday and now the demise of the industry seen quite a lot of potatoes grown here over the years and now uh, very few grown and um, the way the bulb flower trade is going I we could well see the demise of that one of my son's youngest one who's uh, very keen on the dairy side of things he has now gone to Canada for six months on a dairy farm to see the prospects there he sees the prospects here are finished for the dairy um, my other son, my eldest son, he gets outside work whenever he can. So it just leaves me back on the farm for most of the day. And that's probably the next generation gone then. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. But if farming is in its death throes, can the islands survive on tourism alone? I think in ten years' time, if there aren't as many farmers, I think the, the visitor industry, the tourist industry, will be a dead duck as well because I believe that the farmers are one of the best conservationists going, and they look after the land, they, they look after the amenities, if you like, or that the visitors come to see, and so when the farming industry closes down, the islands are back to scrub. The Isles of Scilly have all the problems we all face in modern life, plus a few of their own. In many ways, they do represent Britain in miniature. And if they can overcome their difficulties and manage to flourish despite everything in these lovely surroundings, well, there's hope for all of us. And now from the sunny Isles of Scilly, over to London to find out what the weather's going to be like for the rest of the week. With the most detailed forecast anywhere on television, here's the Countryfile Weather News. Good afternoon to you. Well, after the dry spring in England and Wales since 1893, it's easy to forget that it's actually been quite wet over the north, in the north of Scotland, in fact, very wet indeed. And we're all going to see some rain this week, some quite heavy rain, I think, particularly northern and western parts once again. And that's today's weather chart. We've got a front lying across the country. It's moving very slowly from west to east with some chilly northwesterly winds coming in behind it. It's pegging temperatures back at around about 14 or 15. So that's woefully low for the early part of June, only just into the, uh, well, upper 50s Fahrenheit, just about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. On the eastern side of the country, it's around about 17, 63 at the present time, but it's probably going to turn cooler as the afternoon goes on. 
Got some quite extensive rain running across the south at the moment, some heavy rain too, running through northwest England and also up in the far northeast of Scotland, some quite persistent rain. Now elsewhere it's a bit brighter, the best of the sunshine here over Ireland and just coming into West Wales. And we're going to find that brighter weather moving across the rest of Wales into central England during the afternoon. But it's going to take a long time before this rain eventually clears away from Kent, probably well into the evening. And at the same time, the heavier pulses of rain over northwest England pushing across the rest of the north of Britain. So Scotland finishing up pretty cloudy for the rest of the day with outbreaks of rain never too far away. Well, tonight, still a few showers around in the west. The rain having cleared away from the extreme southeast, but the rain over northeast England also fading away leaving just northeastern parts of Britain cloudy with rain later on tonight. Not particularly cold anywhere, at about 6 to 8 degrees, so don't worry too much about any ground frost. Well, tomorrow, a rather simplified picture shows a little ridge of high pressure coming across from the west. So many places enjoying a fine day, though there will be some showers scattered around, I think particularly in the west in the morning, other showers breaking out further east through the day. So I think there's a good chance tomorrow that you will miss them, and with more sunshine around, probably 18 degrees on offer, 64 Fahrenheit, way down in the south of England. Well, on Tuesday, it's a bright start for central and eastern parts of the country, but you can see here another weather front coming in from the west of the Great Lick, and that's going to bring quite a bit of rain to western and northern parts as we run through the day on Tuesday, but it's going to take a long time again before that rain reaches East Anglia and the southeast. It's probably going to be well into the evening before the rain sets in there. At the same time, brighter showery weather returning to the Western Isles through the late afternoon. Well, Wednesday, arguably the wettest day of the week, probably late into Wednesday, early Thursday morning, probably a spell of bright, really quite heavy rain coming in. This weather system in the southwest merging with another area of low pressure up to the northwest of Scotland. That means to say most places are seeing quite a bit of rain on Wednesday into Thursday. Something rather showery though later on. Now Thursday looks like this with these cooler northwesterly winds returning. That's bad news for the Cornhill Test Series which starts at Trent Bridge of course on Thursday. Not a very auspicious start. Quite a lot of showers coming through for the end of the week, Thursday and Friday. The charts hardly changing at all. So watch out for some heavy showers later in the week, some of them with hail and some thunder. There will be a bit of sunshine between these showers, of course, but with the winds in the northwest, it's never going to be terribly warm. But it certainly will be warm for the start of the World Cup over there in Europe. Temperatures around about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's it from me for now. Well, we're back on the mainland now, and this is Castle Drogo on the edge of Dartmoor one of the many places of historic interest or natural beauty run by the National Trust, which is now the largest conservation charity anywhere in the world. Yet the Trust appears to stand on the touchlines of environmental politics, or does it? In a few weeks' time, we'll be presenting a profile of Dame Jennifer Jenkins, chairman of the Trust. And during it, we'd like to put to her some of your questions about this organisation, which has been called the Housekeeper to the Nation. So write to us at Countryfile, BBC Pebble Mill, Birmingham B57QQ. That's Countryfile, BBC Pebble Mill, Birmingham B57QQ. And that's all for this week. Until the same time next Sunday, goodbye. <laughs>until about a year ago, uh, most environmentalists couldn't even spell economics, and now we realise that it is important to get involved. There must be this marriage of ecology and economics which will help to save the planet, and green taxes have a role to play within that, as one of perhaps four or five key policy instruments, regulations of course being the second one, which could be used to sort out uh, the mess that we're in.